to the fiscal cliff in January of 2013, where the Republicans <coughs> and the Democrats in the U.S. are going to decide, I think it's pretty clear, that they're going to spend more money. They're not going to raise the taxes like they said they were. They're not going to cut the spending like they said they were. Why? The economy is weak. And one of the only tools that they have at the central bank level and the uh, federal government level is to borrow and spend, deficit financing, and printing money. And one of the things that does to you is deteriorate your purchasing power. In 1970, when I was going into ninth grade, I said to myself, Lou, if you can make $10,000 a year, you got it made. Doctors made 10,000 account. How many people can confirm that 10,000 was pretty good wage in 1970? I guess I'm the oldest guy in the world. 10,000 was professional money. You could have a nice shack and a great ride and a good life in 1970. In 1971, Richard Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. In 1970, an ounce of gold sold for $35. By 1978, after releasing the currency from the anchor of gold, it cost $30,000 to have the same purchasing power as $10,000 in 1970, in just eight years. Today, you need a minimum of $150,000 in income to buy the same lifestyle you could buy with $10,000 in 1970. Gold is the only asset that has performed to maintain that purchasing power and accelerate it. Gold and silver have done very well, as well as other rare items. And that's really the driver when you look at the fit markets for physical precious metals. It's the scarcity. There is only so much coming out. If you've been following the gold miners as I have for many years, their costs keep going up and their deposits keep getting thinner. They're looking further afield. Instead of having rich veins to mine, they're taking lower grades and having to spend more time and money to process that particular uh, ore body. It's very difficult to get it out of the ground, plus demand is accelerating. So tight supply, excessive demand drives the price of the commodity. And uh, as an instructor at Sheridan College, when I'm teaching macroeconomics, it's very clear when I show a chart for gold going back to 1970, it's taken off for one reason. There is lack of supply and excess demand. We talk about it all the time on the show. Today we got the report from the International Monetary Fund about central bank buying from emerging economies like Brazil, another 40 tons of gold bought by the central bank as part of their investment in reserves of currencies and precious metals in an effort to keep their economy. <coughs> so these are the commodities that we're talking about. I'm glad you could join us today. I want to in, uh, introduce you to Darren Long. He's going to be the first presenter from Guildhall Wealth Management. He's a young man that has gotten excited about the metals. He excited me about the metals because he's so passionate and knowledgeable. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome Darren Long to the stage? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many people that are interested in the things that we're very passionate about as a firm. And it's a pleasure, and some would say even an honor, to have somebody like Lou Skizis enter the room and speak to somebody to start off an event like this. And you represent a very small portion of people who are waking up and, and they're seeing different changes around the world. And essentially, you're being given the opportunity to be amongst the first and the most astute, in my opinion, to take advantage of markets like precious metals. So I'm going to try to give this presentation in a timely manner so as not to take up too much of your valuable time. And I would ask that if you have questions about precious metals or colored diamonds, that you reserve them until the end of the presentation, at which point you can speak with any of the brokers here, Paul, myself, Lou, all be happy, Nicole's here, everybody, the whole team from Guildhall will be happy to answer any questions you have. And of course, beyond that, set up any additional time that you would require to ask about our investments. So again, if we look at precious metals, 
in today's portfolio management, it should represent, gold and silver should make up about 10 to 25% of your portfolio. Now, I would probably guess that the majority of you, a large majority of you, do not own precious metals, let alone physical precious metals. You know it's happening. You see the headlines every day. You probably are aware that gold is much higher than it was a few years ago. You probably said to yourself, I wish I bought it when it was much cheaper. But the reality is that most of us don't own these assets, and we should. There was a study done in 2005 by a company called Ibbotson and Associates, and that study was to determine whether or not the concept of diversity, as we've known it, was actually successful in its attempt to build a profitable outcome for investors. So they did, they did a study, and this study looked at 30 years of data, and what they determined was that first and foremost, institutions, analysts, advisors, planners, bank managers, they weren't paying attention to what was happening in the market. And the conclusion that they came to was that in fact the three main parts of our portfolio, bonds, stocks, and cash, for most of us, were actually positively correlated. And what that determined was essentially that if you were to look at your portfolio in today's age, you had ups, downs, periods of consolidation, large economic changes, and we had assets in our portfolios that were all moving the same way. Even though our advisors were telling us we needed to diversify, we needed to change what was in our portfolio, we need to be better at managing the money we did have. The reality is we weren't diversifying. In fact, what this study proved at looking through the market data and the portfolios, that by far and large, the reality was you did not have any diversity in your portfolio. Precious metals are, believe it or not, the most opposite correlated asset class you can own to your existing traditional stocks, bonds, and cash portfolios. They work in the exact opposite nature in most cases, and they are something that they determine should in fact be part of your portfolio. For the purposes of our presentation tonight, we're going to stick to silver. In my opinion, silver is the most undervalued precious metal in the world today. It represents, in my opinion, the absolute best opportunity moving forward for somebody that's interested in making profit and changing their life outcomes. And you can see that the average silver price since 2002, as it's shown in that chart, has gone from basically $3.80 where Guild Hall showed up at 2002 and started trading these markets, all the way up to as high as 49 but today as we speak here, just below $34 an ounce, between $33 and $34 an ounce. So if we look at what lessons we're getting from that, we can go and assume that going forward, based on what we're seeing in the market, that things are only going to get better. And what we're going to do here is tell you why. There you can see the average silver price since 2002. Now, how many in this room own silver? I'm not here to challenge your pocketbooks. I'm sure probably the majority of you by far and large, there's a handful of you own silver. It's fantastic to see that. But the reality is, as good as gold has been, silver has been really excellent for investors. And it's something that needs to be considered because if you look at whether or not people are investing in silver, the reality is only 3 to 4% of the entire globally managed asset portfolio around the world is actually parked in gold or silver. 3 to 4%. Right today, that's it. And with 3 to 4%, the price of silver has rallied over 700% in 10 years. So going forward, the promise of more people coming aboard, like yourselves, and buying silver and actually adding it to your portfolio is extremely high, and it most likely will mean higher prices along the way. Now, we've had four major bull markets in the last 100 years, all of them in precious metals, of course, all gold and silver, and the reality is that during those four major bull markets, participation in all globally managed assets has met or exceeded 20%. So if we look at where we are right now, we're sitting at 3 to 
and all of the last four bull markets in 100 years have had 20% or greater. So in terms of being promising, I would obviously venture a guess at this point, it's long term, but based on that reality, suggest to you that silver is going much, much higher. And in the 70s, which we're going to look at in a little bit more depth tonight, that bull market, the last time we saw gold and silver take off and huge rallies in, uh, you know, in, in the markets worldwide in the prices of silver and gold, the last time that happened, that period of time, 10 years, was a period in which more millionaires were made, more so than any other time in history. It's never been repeated, not in the dot-com era, not in any other era. In those 10 years, more millionaires were made because they invested and sold silver than in any other time in history. So when we look at silver, or gold for that matter, but precious metals in general, the last four bull markets have told us there are four major building blocks, four fundamentals that are essential to seeing higher prices. We're going to cover them all here tonight, but for the purposes of getting going through this presentation, I'm going to put them onto the screen for you, and you can take a look at them. It's global currency devaluation, and when we started doing this back in 2002, it actually was just the U.S. dollar, and we were more concerned with the loss of value that we were seeing. It's the reserve currency of the world, and when it starts losing value on an accelerated basis, it's a concern for everyone. So we were looking at global currency devaluation, and now in this day and age, currencies all around the world are being devalued. They're being printed, as Lou said earlier, and this is something that's of great concern. We have inflation. We have geopolitical hotspots, reasons that whole countries are buying gold and silver to protect themselves. And of course, the most important building block of all is supply and demand. Quite simply put, I'll go through the, the stats tonight, but this is on its own a reason, aside from everything else, that I myself would encourage you to own silver, if for another, any other reason. So if we look at the recent history and the bullish building blocks that I just talked about, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Back in 1971, the U.S., the big mega power, was the tail end of Vietnam. The U.S. had amassed a tremendous amount of debt, as it always does when they go through periods of war. They've seen it, you know, we've seen it lately. It happened back then as well. They were in debt to many countries. President Nixon knew that the monetary base was expanding. He knew money was being printed. He knew that that was going to change the outcomes of the average American citizen and the economy. He couldn't stop it from happening, but he also knew that there was something in the way from that happening. There used to be a gold standard. It meant that you could not print more money than you had gold to back it. At that time, gold was pegged against the U.S. dollar. It was $35 an ounce, 1971. Nixon comes on air, and he says to the American people, we're ending the gold standard. You can look at the, t the, the clip up on YouTube. I highly recommend you do it. He says, we're going to end this standard, and it's not at all going to impact you. He reassures the public, in fact, there's not going to be a period of money printing. We're not going to go down that path. We're simply ending the gold standard. There are reasons for it. Among other countries are coming calling for their debt. We owe other countries, and they're asking for their debt in gold. We don't want to give up our debt. It protects us. So our gold, we, it protects us. So ultimately, he said, end the gold standard. And in a period of a couple of weeks, it was ended. We went into the next generation and the next decade. And as I said earlier, at that time, gold was sitting at around $35 an ounce, and silver was sitting at $1.55 per ounce. And that was in 1971. And again, the people were losing faith. I mean, ultimately, the currency of the day is only backed by our confidence in it. It's backed by nothing. So when you get rid of a gold standard, people's faith and their loss of faith in that currency accelerated. So what happened was, during the next decade, we saw gold in the 1970s jump from $35 an ounce all the way to January of 1980, where it topped out at $850 an ounce. Now, if you look at that chart, that's very impressive. And I can assure you, the same things that got the price of silver and gold to go from such low prices to such high prices are happening now. 
history is definitely repeating itself as I'm speaking to you here tonight. And that's a rise of 2,300%. Not a bad decade for a gold investor if you were there. Now, what I will say is that as good as gold was, this is a presentation about silver, and silver was much better. In fact, silver in the 1970s, as you can see the chart is going to show, went from $1.55 all the way up to $52 an ounce. It's a 3,200% gain in 10 years. And again, very few of us can recant stories of any of our family members owning it or benefiting from it. But as I said, more millionaires were made in those 10 years in a quicker and shorter period of time than in any other time in history to this point. So in the 1970s, let's take a look at what we saw. We had federal debt that was tolerable. In the US, it was about $1 trillion, as opposed to today being $16 trillion. And when I throw around terms like trillion and billion, I'm going to show you a visual of what that money looks like so you can understand, because I think we lose perspective on it. We don't understand quite what that means. But federal debt was tolerable. Citizens had savings rates. Back in 71, 72, savings rates on average were about 10% in the US, and in Canada, very similar as well. Today, if we fast forward, we have little or no savings rates, especially in the US, especially post-2008. Saving rates have dropped.